Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Shepard. And I'm Chad Shepard. And coming up on Shep Shower and Shave today, we talk to all-pro former Lions wide receiver Herman Moore. We talk about the Lions draft. We talk about how he stays in such great shape and some of the great memories that he had with some of the best Lions teams that we can recall. That's all coming up here on Shep Shower and Shave. Shep Shower and Shave is brought to you by Fifth Avenue in Royal Oak. That's where we're broadcasting right now. What a fantastic venue this is for all the great beer specials in Gone Country, which is a bar crawl that starts on Saturday, June 24th. This is where you want to start it, right here. Tony, Dan, and the rest of the crew here at Fifth Avenue in Royal Oak. And we're brought to you by Northwestern Tech. Herman Moore is a good friend of mine, and Herman Moore is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, wide receiver in Lions history. And he joins us here on Shep Shower and Shave. How do you stay in such great shape, man? I mean, you know, here's, here's what I've always noticed. With guys who play football, the big guys, when they're done, they end up losing weight. The smaller guys end up gaining weight. You are pretty close to your playing weight and size. Is that fair? I'm, I'm spot on right now at 218 wow. pounds. This is probably when I was uh, at my optimal weight and when I was you know, repeatedly going to the Pro Bowl, played at 218 pounds. You try and eat lean and, and uh, get a little bit of exercise in. And as you get older, as you know, I mean, you got to be able to take care of yourself and so, that, so your body takes care of yourself. You, you talked about how these guys, uh, when they – the, the little fellas like to get <laughs> to become really big fellas. I've yeah. seen some of the defensive backs that have they're like 300 pounds. And I'm not – hey, listen, I'm being honest. 300 pounds How from 185, 200 pounds, they have 300 pounds now. How does that happen? Is it just so much work to maintain when, they, when they're younger and they are smaller that when they let it go, it, it's kind of like a bursting belt and they just really let it go? I think what happens is the guys that did all the running – think about this. We do all the running. Mm -hmm. Defensive backs, wide receivers, there's a ton of running. They probably get tired of running, so they don't want to do it anymore. The linemen, they don't have to go far. They're in True. shorter spaces, True. short bursts, and then now when they get older, it's like, oh, I'm going to go out and run, and then all of a sudden they start getting into it, and the weight starts falling off, and all of a sudden they're smaller than I am. Well, but you were, you were a track star too, and your wife was a mm -hmm. track star too at the University of Virginia. So yep. do you think that helps? I mean, do you enjoy running? Is it something you still enjoy doing? I just enjoy staying active. Okay. and uh, physically fit and I it also saves you money you don't have to keep changing your wardrobe all the time and <laughs> yeah. changing out clothes you know how that gets yeah. you go you start complaining that the dry cleaners that your clothes are shrinking because you're gaining weight and yeah. you want to be you know <laughs> upset with everybody else I don't want to do that uh, I just enjoy and I, I go around and I talk a lot to communities talk a lot to the, the kids and the education systems about the importance of health and nutrition is that a big difference to you now, the level of uh, access to that kind of information people have now? Not only players in the NFL, but just your everyday person at home. They knew things that you guys were learning from specialized nutritionists back when you were in your playing days. Uh, you, you learn a lot, and there is the ability to be able to have access to a lot of information, even on how to lose weight, how to eat healthy, foods that aren't good for you. And uh, that's all good stuff. And uh, right now, if, if you want to have longevity and, and live a healthy life, you, you have to care enough to be concerned about what you put in your body, and uh, that's that's what I try and preach. Lions used a third-round draft pick on a kid by the name of Kenny Galladay out of Northern Illinois. You called some Mid-American Conference games with me when we were partnered together as voices of Eastern Michigan football, and and I remember a couple of conversations you and I had where you're like, man, I'm kind of surprised at at the level of play of certain players in the Mid-American Conference. You coming from the ACC, people don't always get an opportunity to see mid-majors. What's the most important characteristic a wide receiver should have as he makes the transition from college to pro, do you think? You have to first and foremost recognize that you're starting over. The, the level of competition evens out. Uh, I would imagine the kids that come from those, those conferences that aren't called the SEC and and all these these major conferences they have the ability to come in and I think at a, at a different mindset because they're always still hungry they're trying to prove their worth they're trying to prove that they can play at that higher level the, the, the thing that I see most is that they don't realize the speed of it and that's been even from my time and even before I came into the NFL the speed and the athleticism of the game continues to get better and better now where you can win is through consistency and technique. That's the thing that I see that has fallen off. The, the, the kids don't come in as sharp. They don't come in as, a, as disciplined on the fundamentals of football or the technical aspects of the game. 
So if there's a place where you can separate yourself from the pack, it, it comes off of the ability to be more detailed and a little bit better uh, at sharpening your tools. He was a three-time Pro Bowler, and he is still Virginia's all-time single season receiving leader. Herman Moore is with us on Shep, Shower, and Shave. Who taught you? I mean, maybe at Virginia and yep. then when you made it to the next level. There was a guy, uh, Tom Sherman. He, he used to be a quarterback for Penn State. And uh, when I came in, he was uh, the, not only the guy that recruited me when I was out of Danville, Virginia, uh, George Washington High School, but he was also the guy that uh, coached the wide receivers. And he was very much a stickler about technique. We didn't. It wasn't so much about you got to go out and learn everything at once, but we had to do it in phases to where you perfected every aspect of the game. Where, and that's why it was known as being a hands catcher because he wouldn't allow us to, to cradle the ball. He wouldn't allow us to catch it in our body. Yeah. And then working footwork and then understanding how to catch passes that weren't perfect passes. That's why I never complain about a bad pass because I don't think there really is one if you can get your hands near it. If you mm. create those type of fundamentals and you start to eliminate the reason for excuses, you make players better. Uh, when you talk about Galladay, and, and I had an opportunity to meet him at a rookie uh, symposium, a rookie uh, get-together that we had with the alumni base here in Detroit. Big kid, has a lot of athleticism, has the ability. And I asked him, I said, what, did it, what, what have you seen to be the most challenging thing so far coming in? He said, learning the playbook and just how this, the speed of things. And you, have to, you, you can't play at that top speed because you're, you're learning. And when you're thinking and you're right. trying to do it at the same time, it slows you down. But I just I told him, I said, just take it in one little bit at a time. And then as you continue to get better, the game will become slower, and but you will play faster. You, you mentioned a key word there, and that's thinking. That'll slow you down a lot. Because so much is new to him, a lot of it's just a matter of reps. Isn't it? He's got to do some of these things for the second, third, fourth time as opposed to everything he's doing being brand new. Then it becomes a little more second nature, and over time you, you develop that skill set to a point where all of a sudden you're a veteran walking into your ninth or tenth camp and you're teaching the younger guys. You're absolutely right, and he has the opportunity now. That that third slot is, is really wide open, and right now I, I almost say it's, it's his to lose. When I look at his size and his ability, uh, he can provide them that piece where you need a guy that can create. And it's not that Marvin Jones can't do that. He's a certain type of receiver. Golden Tate is a certain type of receiver that has a specialty. But they don't have that guy that goes out and creates. And he can come up with plays when plays aren't there. But he has the physical ability to do that. And, and it, like you're saying, I mean, if, if he goes out and understands that the game is fast and, yeah, and I can get a, a, a away from having to think about it, the playbook will, will start to look very easy. It actually becomes a, his friend. And, and not something that, that's working against them. Derek Carr today for the Oakland Raiders signed an extension that will make him the highest paid player in the NFL. Should the Lions lock up Matt Stafford and give him that title, do you believe? Uh, no, they should lock me up and let me play quarterback <laughs> instead for 12. <laughs> I, I, I look at it this I think way. you'd be doing podcasts if that were the case. <laughs> no. Uh, but listen, he, with Matthew Stafford, the question becomes, is he worth that money? He is worth that money because he's worth that to the Detroit Lions. Can he get that somewhere else, depending on the depth, depending on the team's need, depending on their defense, depending on their offensive line? Some teams can get away with not having to pay a guy $25 million to produce the stats that you would get from a guy like Matthew Stafford. But the Lions are in a position to where this team's success, God forbid that Matthew Stafford anything happens, puts this team at a, at a, at a tough position. Look at when you lose your left tackle. Right what disarray it puts your Taylor offense Decker. into yeah. now lose your quarterback yeah. now which one now what does that do so 25 million probably looks like a pretty good deal for the lions for matthew Be stafford because you were you played at such a high level because you were so great do you watch football games and say i would have liked to have played with that guy i would have liked to have caught passes from that guy or is that too much of a fandom on my part would you have liked to have caught passes from a guy like matt stafford you know what people ask me that all the time I'm not going to sit there and throw a guy like Scott Mitchell under the bus or right. a guy like Eric Kramer. The only thing I would have asked for, and I think any receiver looks for, is consistency at the position. Okay. Just like a quarterback looks for a consistency and rapport with his receivers at a position. You don't want to constantly have guys coming in and coming out. We had that too much of that rotation that was taking place with the quarterback position. We had too much uncertainty, even when we picked a guy like Scott Mitchell, that there became some inconsistency, there became some concern. Those are the things that hurt you as a team. You have to be able to work through sometimes when things aren't quite right to figure out what's the right formula and the right mix. And I don't, don't think that we paid enough attention 
until you saw Matthew Stafford really settle in and become that guy, this is the first time in 20 years that there's it, it's kind of settled down. There's no questions about the position. Right. Or at less than 20 years. I don't know how old I am. Matt. But it's been a minute yeah. before we had a guy before Matthew that it, you could just sit there and not worry about what the quarterbacking situation looked like. Had, had you ever wanted to get involved in front office? I mean, you're a good evaluator of talent, and I know that because you and I talk a lot of football during the season. You tell me who you like. When you and I called college football together, you made certain notes about certain guys. Did you ever want to get into a front office? I would have loved to have had the ability to, to be in a, a coaching or a front office position because I love, an, I love analyzing. I love analytics. I love predictive modeling. I love taking and looking physically at someone and, and being able to, to determine what their capabilities are. When you understand the game, you understand what the elements are that are needed. You can spread that around every position because there's some consistency in mindset. There's some consistency in uh, uh, athletic ability that is needed mm -hmm. if you understand what the position requires. There's an understanding of uh, character and what that means. We, we, there are some intangibles that we, just don't, we don't think are relevant when it comes to making the whole player and making the team gel together. And, when you can you can put that all together and create that recipe, that's the stuff. I like challenges yeah. of being able to, to figure out how do you fix this? Right, how do you fix things? It's too easy when on paper everything just adds up. All right, right? One plus of, yeah. one is two. There's got to be right. some – it's almost a black box factor where you know the input, you know the output. What's going on in the middle there? And a guy who can recognize that and figure that out has a place in an NFL yeah. front office. And, this, and the other thing to that, you, you have to be able to – be willing to step outside of it and just not say I'm comfortable looking at film. You yeah, can't you just yeah, watch yeah. film all yeah. day and determine that you have the right players and you have the right team. Right. You do There's, a good job of that. You got to analyze the, everything yeah. as a whole and, and 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 play some of the odds too. But uh, um, the game has evolved. The sport has changed. There's a lot more tools and ways to evaluate. Even when you look at the combines, it's more than just, you know, you see that starting to evolve a little bit more because yeah. we realize it's more than just a 40-yard dash that determines whether or not yeah, a guy I've can in the skill position can never play. never been a big fan of that. What's your take on Bob Quinn so far, or is it too early in his tenure? I believe it's still too early in his tenure. I, I look at it like this. You, Michigan is a big market for real estate. You go out and you find property and you figure out how to rehab it. I look at Quinn as being similar. He said, okay, I've acquired – this property i've acquired this this opportunity now i got to go in and fix some things there are some things that are very visible if i got a broken window i know i need to replace it if i got some some things over the door i got to put a new door in uh security systems lawn all these things that make it right but then all of a sudden i get into the infrastructure and i start looking behind the walls and you start realizing oh man these things start to break down things go wrong you're constantly in this stage of having to repair and fix I don't know where it's going to lead to him, but now I'm going to determine on his skill set, is he capable of fixing things when they break? Mm -hmm. That's how I'm evaluating Bob Quinn. The left tackle situation. Right. Now, yeah. right. what do you do to offset that? You can't always go out and get the player that you need, but how do I make things around that better? Mm -hmm. How do I work with my coaching staff to make sure that that doesn't become problematic now that we know it's a known thing? And that's what we work and we focus on. We don't focus on the fact that we've lost a guy, we're not going to have him, and that's going to be the end of our season. I think a lot, of, a lot of Lions fans, when Taylor Decker went down, obviously it's a huge disappointment, but seeing the speed with which Bob Quinn reacted and that his plan, his contingency plan, was a little different than what we might have seen in the past was a positive thing to them because I think in years past a lot of Lions fans think that, okay, that, that – gap gets filled internally for right. a guy who maybe just isn't cut out for that job and instead Bob Quinn has no problem coming out and, and sending a six round pick to St. Louis and I know Greg Robinson isn't going to be handed the job or may not even ever play for the Lions in a, in a high leverage capacity but the fact that he moved with conviction to go get that guy and then signed Cyrus Quanjo and and took Joe Dahl out of a situation that may have put him in dire straits, I think that made a, a lot of Lions fans feel really impressed with the way he covered for Taylor Decker. I agree. I, I absolutely agree. Do you think the you know how everyone looks at the Patriots and the domination of the Patriots. Are you a are, are you a franchise legacy team type of guy? Do you think it's good for the league, or do you think it's really important the league have a, a little bit more balance there and, and, and other champions than, than the Patriots dominating the way they? Are? I love legacies, and I, I like teams that dominate because that's what makes it special. When you look at and I'll, I'll switch over. I'll, I'll jump sports on you for a minute. When you watch Golden State, how many of us really paid a lot of attention to, to the NBA? I don't want to make anyone mad, but you, <laughs> you, you start waiting for the playoffs. You start waiting for certain matchups to take place. But 
when you can find teams that start to create that or that start to create that 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 just dynasty and they sit on a pedestal that seems higher than others you like seeing teams shoot for something and some entity they got to knock off when you it also makes it you get those premium tickets you don't want to see two sub 500 teams just kind of just fighting all the time and battling all the time you want to see the ones where it's like this is going to be one of those 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 games that's a must see type tv thing i i enjoy it it gives you something to, to kind of wrap something around i agree with you and I'll, I'll add this on i think the patriots being how good they are uh, raises the level of play of the rest of the league. It says, you, here's how good you have to be. And and like you compared with Golden State, Golden State came out, took care of business, and won a title this year in the NBA. And now the, the talk of the NBA offseason is how is Cleveland going to respond? How are they going to counter their roster? Or anybody going to respond? Well, yeah, yeah, and, and pre- people perceive Cleveland to be the closest in line, but how are they going to make tweaks on their end so that they can get back to Golden State, acknowledging that yeah. there is a standard, there's a bar there that has to be met by the rest of the league. And I think it's good to have a really high standard. Speaking of basketball, is Virginia a basketball school? It has taken over. I mean, Tony Bennett's done a good job there. They don't play a, a good great, job. exciting brand of college basketball, but it's they defense. win, but man. The, and that doesn't stop him from being in the conversation every time there's a major head coach in the That's true. You, That's true, because you know, he wins. Because what he did is he said, okay, we may not be able to sit here and score, 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 but if we can keep the scoring down and play excellent defense and transition defense uh, and offense, we can be a we could be a pretty good team, and we don't have a lot of turnovers. They're a disciplined basketball team. Yeah. And they don't foul a whole lot. They, well, they won't we, beat but, themselves. But and they got to do, do that in the ACC against teams like Duke and North Carolina, Carolina who they're facing yeah. twice a year. Why do we do this, though? Why do we use phrases like defense wins championships, and then when a team plays defense like that, Boy. all we do is chop them down? <laughs> because the, the excitement of scoring is fun. No one wants to see a, a football game with a lot of field goals. Right. <laughs> right. You're right. I mean, when and, Alabama and, and LSU played and it was 9-6 in the championship game, people thought it was one of the worst. Cha- but it was a great great defensive battle you have to have a certain perspective do you not I, I like to say this though you know in basketball I really don't like seeing a lot of defense now because I've gotten so used to the you know 40 points in the first quarter right that's 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 just phenomenal that's just that's a lot of shooting and you're waiting to see guys launch long you know the dunk has become kind of old unless you're dunking over somebody and it's spectacular right and guys are so tall if and you're athletic. posterizing somebody yeah, it, it's, yeah. Cool. It, right. it's, it's, it's different football is it's exciting when you have a lot of scoring, but defense, when you got that defense that shuts down teams, I don't know, it's just something about it for me. I, I, think, I, I think it's pretty cool. I think it's harder for the average fan to appreciate good basketball defense as well because normally you're the guy in the YMCA squatting low and you, you know <laughs> some, you really can't tell effective defense because the game's not well officiated in that case. It's probably going to be a foul when you think you made a nice play, things yeah. like that. I think there's just less appreciation for the average fan for, for a tough yeah. tough defensive basketball team. The only thing that's become bad for me when I look at basketball is every time a guy shoots and he misses, he looks at, I don't care, he might look at a fan right. in the stands thinking a fan fouled him. <laughs> yeah, but wait a minute. Hold on, hold on a second. Wide receivers do the same no, thing. Man. Oh, on every no. route, wide receivers no. do the same thing. <laughs> no, come on, Matt. I can't let you throw the wide receivers under the under the bus, man. They, we, we well it, nowadays, yeah, I, I can agree. I don't know why anyone can. Not complains. back in your day. Yeah, I mean, you were getting mauled and held and and uh, that five better? yard rule. You know, anything went within the first five yards. I mean, grabbing and just. Was it better then? Do they need to return to that? Yeah, it would be. It, I would be a little bit more exciting. Not to mention you're wearing and, it. And also make the middle become that danger zone again. Yeah. Right. Right. They're not going to do that ever. But well, You were yeah. also wearing shoulder pads that today's linebackers are wearing and things like that. Well, yeah. same thing with the helmets. Oh, you know, yeah. And, and oh, Herman yeah. would be the first to tell you. I mean, even the face Her- Herman's as sharp as it gets, but you went through it. You had a lot of concussions, I had didn't a lot. you? Yeah, it's six. I think it was that you know of. Six. Yeah, six that I know that of. That you know of. I'm going to go back through and look at my uh, records because I have every I have about literally about 1,500 pages of every medical record that was given to me. Wow. Okay. And uh, even handwritten notes. All right, now this, this is a tough <laughs> question here. You, you heard what Warren Sapp said recently, right? Okay, he's, he's donating his brain to science because he's forgotten some things. Have you reached the point where you've forgotten some things that raises your level of concern? Absolutely, short term is, 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 is bad. You know, leave, giving yourself text, or having people text you messages on a regular basis or remind you of, of things because you, you for me it's it's forgetting a lot of 
things short term. Uh, long term, it's, it's hard to really go back and remember a ton of things. I'm just saying that because it's like whatever, but it it is. It's it's even childhood things. It's just memories. They just things are just gone. And I know you lose a little bit when you get older. Yeah. But it is. Uh, there are some concerns. I have some some concerns when it comes to that. Does your body ache the way Calvin Johnson described his body aching after he started getting up in the morning? It does. It it takes a a little bit, probably half an hour or so, just to kind of get going. Because uh, everything seems really stiff, and and uh, your your motion and your 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 movements are a little different. And I've had, I've separated all fingers. I've separated my both shoulders. I've had knee injuries, foot injuries. You know, you name it. And when you have an accumulation of all those injuries, at some point, it, it catches up with you. And I try and keep it uh, and offset it a little bit with trying to stay physically active, but it becomes challenging. Mm. What was it like playing for George Welsh at Virginia? <laughs> He's the all-time leader in Cavaliers football history as a head coach and seemed like a great guy. What, what made those years special for you when you were contending for ACC titles? With, with George Welsh, he was a, a stickler for discipline, and he really wanted us to be a, a, a very disciplined, detail-oriented football team. Uh, he really... Being because of his his Navy background, uh, he really wanted us to go out and make sure that we were men and that we were in control at all times of everything that we did out on the field, that we didn't allow our emotions to overtake us uh, and all those things. I'll tell you real quick a, a quick story I had with George. There was a guy that I just really didn't think liked me. Even though they brought me and gave me a scholarship and all those things, and it, I realized later he really wanted to just get the most out of me. But I remember it was a defining moment that turned it around for me there. He, had, I, I Sean Moore had thrown a football pass to me. It was kind of low on the ground. It skipped one time before it got to me, and I kind of left the football land on the ground. I walked away from it. And I was walking back to the huddle versus jogging back, and he said very peacefully, Herman, run back to the huddle. And I just kind of looked at him and didn't say anything, and then he yelled it at me, and then it, it – it, caused me to kind of get outside of myself and be a little bit more vocal back to him and then he just said you're out of here get off my field and he says and take you know and when you get in there take off my uniform take off our uniform you're no longer on this team and I literally started taking off everything walking <laughs> back really just leaving it there. you left the trail there's, right. a, there's a shoe there's a sock <laughs> here's your helmet here's your shoulder pad here's everything mm. realizing I was going to run out of clothes pretty quick if I <laughs> either didn't hurry up and get into the locker room or catch you know come to my senses but I realized how immature that was and and at the end of the day I was hurting nothing but myself and he came back and and told me to come back to the team because he felt that I, I hadn't completed my destiny and uh what from that day what year was that That was my junior year going into my no, junior year really before we started that season which I ended up becoming a starter set uh, the single yeah. season record I believe in receiving yeah, it just it, it yeah. just became a, a tremendous year for me and, and ended up being an all-american right, and right and and leading uh, the nation in some some categories and um, finishing yeah. in the Heisman trophy and uh, I could have thrown that all away over something stupid and that was he was just asking me to, to check my character by saying hey run back to the huddle interesting yeah, yeah. that's a great story do, do you think uh, or do you have any empathy for the younger guys who I mean in today's day and age, Maybe that moment never gets to occur because it's open practice and there's fans and media there and your coach acts differently and the player responds differently. Do you think some of those teaching moments are lost for these younger guys because of technology and the media landscape and social media constantly broadcasting everything? It is. It, you, you have to be able to let these guys not only grow up, but you have to. there's got to be accountability. Uh, we talk about accountability on the on the field, but the accountability off the field a lot of times is what prevents these guys from really reaching that that apex and reaching that top goal in their career. We have to also be willing to allow them uh, some space and understanding that times do and have changed. Mm -hmm. And we, as the older generation, whether it's coaches, parents, whatever, we have to be able to also understand some of the challenges that they may have and also how do we adjust and how do we adapt so that we can intelligently provide them information that is useful versus um, criticizing uh, mm -hmm. that it comes across sometimes and restricting their space. Uh, so there's a there's some, some education that needs to take place on both sides and as long as that occurs, I think we become assets 
uh, to these to these younger players, and we, we, we help secure their future wherever that destiny may lead them. All right, before I let you go, because I know you got a, another appointment, um, why do you still live here? You could you, you could live anywhere <laughs> you want, okay, but you had a nice long career here in Detroit, and you and your wife have chose to, to keep this home. What What is it about Metro Detroit, about the state of Michigan, that allowed you to – to, to really keep your roots here now or replant your roots, if you will. I came here in Michigan in uh, 91 when I was 20 years old right. and uh, soon to be 21, and I grew up here. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. I, I, I was born and raised in Virginia, but I grew up in Michigan. Hmm. And this is what I've, I've gotten to know. The, the people here is where I've established who I am today and the, the personality and uh, certain characteristics that make me who I am. So I've adopted... Uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, just there's a lot that within me that is Michigan and when I go back to Virginia it's funny because it seems slower but it's a beautiful state oh I love so I, I'm kind of I, I got that dual piece going uh, but at the same time I just I, I I've loved the the response of the community and then also being here uh, the way I've been received has been phenomenal and uh, that's why I look to stay. I'll tell you one of the coolest things Chad that I, I experienced was I went back to Virginia when e Eastern Michigan was playing and I forget which team it was now but we went to the Virginia Hall of Fame and we walked through it and I remember I sent yep. you a text where I called you Ver, uh, you know obviously Herman was right in there and hit the Virginia Hall of Fame is right down the street from Sweet Georgia Browns right mm -hmm. we're we're uh, um, the, right the on former, the East Coast re, re, former the former lion Roger Brown owns a, a restaurant there okay now it's not as spacious as Fifth Avenue I, they, I don't think they're you know it's not as, as as enjoyable on the outside but it's right down the street from the Virginia Hall of Fame and we had a chance to go in there and see Herman Moore's bust in there. It was really, really cool. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. That was an honor uh, to be recognized there and also being recognized here at the Michigan Sports Hall of Fame. Right, right. And uh, that's maybe pretty, that's, that, that's, a, that's a hell of an impact, don't you think? It, it, I mean, it goes a long that. way. Yeah. And the irony, when I got inducted into the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame, it was Bobby Ross who sat on the board yeah. who made the recommendation. And here's a guy that he and I were like oil and water <laughs> at times when he was here and uh, had an opportunity to mend the fences with him because I don't like to hold grudges and I don't want anyone holding grudges against me. And uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it, it was a special moment. I went in with Alonzo Mourning and a couple other really you know, uh, notable Virginians. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then who'd you go into the Michigan Sports Hall of Fame with? Now you test me. That's that short-term memory piece there, right there, um, man. Okay. That well, long-term piece. Just, just real quick, the, the Bobby Ross situation. Why was That's that? That's a good a, question. I'm gonna have to go look that up. Why, why was that important for you to to, to mend that fence with Bobby? Uh, because of the way everything went when he was here. They came in with a different mindset. You saw it happen with whether it's Robert Porsche, Barry, myself, and they had an idea how they wanted to shape the team, and along that meant reshaping us as players, refocusing our thoughts and our contributions to the team, which we may not agree with. And when you worked a long time together with, with players and, and systems to determine who you are, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden that gets upended, and now you have to become something that you don't feel that you are. And for me, it was more of a, a, a different type of wide receiver that I don't think really allowed me to, to flourish and become the guy that I was. And it was indicative in my, my, my contribution to the team. Gotcha. And the last four or five years I had here, I mean, I don't think I even got, uh, you know, a thousand yards, hmm. and, and it was just a sharp fall off. And it, you, you, you feel that somebody's got to be responsible for that other than yourself. And I think I had to carry some of the blame when I look back as an older individual. In hindsight, I could have made a, a different decision. I could have approached it a little bit differently. I think that would have helped the relationship. But I, I felt that the coach could have done the same, and I still sure. say that to this day. Yeah, um, it takes two to tangle in that such in, in that arena of co uh, communication. Yep. Uh, Chad just brought it up. 2010. There's your. Class. Oh, there it is. Bob Marion Illich. Yep. Marion Illich. Uh, George Baja. Uh, Bill Fleming. And Eddie Murray's going to be mad at me because I he's a he guy, it. and I didn't remember that. Yep. And Peter uh, Carmano. So yep. Rick Leach, Meg Mallon, hell of a golfer. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, Peter Carmano. John uh, Banchek. Yeah, that's yeah a, and George Blah, man. I know he's the one to probably slap me too. Yeah. <laughs>
that's a that's a hell of a class right there. And, and really, all-time, really, really all-time good great guys. class for yeah, sure. Yeah. And and great guys. And like I said, man, it's uh, you so meet cool. so many people, and I always apologize. I hope I never receive one of those really big awards. I'm gonna just thank everybody, yeah. and not try and break it down to individuals because I know I'm gonna leave out somebody important because there's so many people, whether you're a professional athlete or whether you're a business person or a school teacher, it doesn't matter. There are people who impact your life that give you that defining moment, that turning point, that that gives you that 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 advice that makes the difference yeah and you just never want to leave anybody out and i can't get to being who i am without help well it's great stuff man i, I appreciate your friendship very much likewise uh, I, I enjoy uh spending time with you i love talking not just football but i learned so many different things about life when you and i have good long discussions like this so thanks a lot for joining us on chef shower and shape we'll talk soon i hope my friend absolutely thank you guys both all right you got it that's herman moore one of the all-time greats uh in detroit lions history three-time pro bowler and, and when you look at his numbers, 670 receptions, over 9,100 yards, uh, over 60 touchdowns. Very, very impressive. Joining us here at Fifth Avenue, which has been a premier destination in Royal Oak, with over 36 cold beers on tap, great food, drink specials, a kitchen that is open until 2 a.m. Just met some of the guys back in the kitchen. They are fantastic. They've got some of these great appetizers out here. You want to take advantage of it. It's right here, Fifth Avenue. We're out here on the outdoor amazing patio that takes place inside. They've got billiards. This entire staff, not only really, really attractive women, uh, but uh, people devoted to making your experience a memorable one. Uh, stop by and, and uh, make sure you come on by and, and take advantage of it. 40 HD TVs, a 14-foot HD, uh, HD projection screen as well. And coming up on Saturday, uh, don't forget the bar crawl uh, that should begin right here at Fifth Avenue. You can check in at 12 o'clock. It's a 1 to 6 p.m. It's got a ton of bars throughout the Royal Oak area, but this is where you either want to start or end up Fifth Avenue right here in Royal Oak. Yeah, I just came from work. I can't imagine a better destination to, to leave the office and head right to. It's, I mean, it's outside. It's a little warm today, and it's still absolutely beautiful on the porch. Sometimes it's better when it's warm because uh, and then you get a, a lot of young ladies uh, dressed to the climate, and that's exactly what young men like you don't don't mind whatsoever. Uh, let's shift gears here for a moment and uh, and remind people that uh, not just is Fifth Avenue a proud sponsor of Shep Shower and Safe Show, it, so is uh, Northwestern Tech. Heating and cooling employers are desperate for trained technicians. Uh, they're having to turn work down because they don't have the people to meet the demand. So uh, they are the number one player in the HVAC field and are seeing their pay potential go way up. They're able to choose companies that's going on to help them grow their careers. You go to Northwestern Tech. That's where you go. Over the last 38 years, people have been getting jobs left and right because of Northwestern Tech's uh, and, and their ability to turn out high qualified people. And Northwestern Tech is the HVAC school. Get trained, certified, and into the field in only 10 and a half months. It's the HVAC school that works. 248-358-40. Zero six, Great stuff with um, Herman Moore. Really appreciate that. I wanted your thoughts on what took place on Wednesday night in Las Vegas. Golden Knights, with the expansion draft, decided to go out, and I think they loaded up on 13 defensemen, Chad. 13 defensemen. But I said this during the week. I, I tweeted this, and I talked about it a lot. I thought, the, the, you and I both agreed, the, the one person that I wanted, or the one person I disagreed with in protecting or not protecting as far as Ken Holland was concerned was Thomas Noshek. Thomas Noshek, 23 years old, 6'3", 210 pound winger, a guy who I thought would make a really good third or fourth line guy. And I thought they should have left Gustav Nyquist unprotected. What did the, Lond what did the uh, I always want to say the London Knights, <laughs> I, even, I even have trouble dropping the loss, and they're just the Vegas Golden Knights. And I even in our last episode, I think I called them the Las Vegas Golden oh, Knights repeatedly. I, I just did. It's just Vegas. Okay. Yeah. So the Vegas Golden Knights take Thomas Noshek from the Red Wings. What was your thought on that, and how disappointed are you, if at all? Look, it stinks. There's no two ways about it. But considering, um, I think, what could have been lost, it's not the biggest loss in the world. Look, in a situation like this, you look at it and you say, okay, assume we were going to lose that player anyways, what could we have gotten for them? And I don't think the value coming back for Thomas Noshik is all that high. He, okay. I don't think he's a top six he's center. Not. He's he's, so if he's a bottom six center, right. and we acknowledged in our in our episode earlier this week that, that the one of the most bizarre things about 
um, the Ken Holland situation that people are so angry about is the bad contracts. And the bad contracts are anchored down the middle. You've locked in Shea for however many years, Glenn Denning for however many years, Helm for however many years, Nielsen, and right. then either Larkin or Zetterberg, depending on what your line combinations are. I think that's frustrating to a lot of fans. Thomas Noshik might have come in and been a great penalty kill guy or power or power play guy or um, to help in that bottom six, but I, I'm not so beaten up over it because I don't think we lost the perceived value of what we could have gotten for him in some kind of trade. I, I think, and, and I thought the question was asked. Um, yeah, but let's face it. I mean, Gustav, I'm not, I'm not saying they, that the, the Knights would have taken uh, Gustav Nyquist, but if you're trying to rid yourself of ugly, laborsome contracts, I mean, Gustav Nyquist makes almost $5 million. Specifically, it's $4.75 million. I don't think he's worth that right, right now. But we have to consider what Vegas' goals are in, la- in in Wednesday's that's uh, my point. expenditure. And but to, to me, that's it, it was pretty clear. They want as many draft picks as they possibly can yep. to stockpile picks and to not get into any bad contracts. You don't want to start a franchise overpaying a guy $5 million who's not worth half of that. So they took guys that made six hundred grand, nine hundred grand, one point two. I, I, I don't disagree with you at all. I didn't think they were going to take Darren Helm because that's a long-term bad contract. But... You could have seen them, and I'm not saying they would have, but you could have seen them taking Gustav Nyquist because he only has two years left on that contract. It's not necessarily an albatross for Vegas. It's more of an albatross for Detroit because of all the bad contracts Detroit has associated with it. Right, so I still think had they exposed Nyquist and protected Noshek, what they would have done is Vegas would have taken Riley Shane. Because it's a it's a one year deal worth two million dollars. I think they got caught in between to a certain extent because we saw there were eight plus teams who worked out trades with Vegas in advance or the night of. Some of those have been announced. Others, the details are, are still emerging. Most of those are for draft picks, but. Uh, the Blue Jackets were able to dump David Clarkson's contract onto Vegas. A couple other contracts were moved around. Uh, They actually took Riley Smith off of the Panthers' hands to free up a little cap space for Florida. They got a 30-goal scorer in Jonathan Marchessault. So there there are some good players. James Neal, obviously, is a big one who who went over there, and there was an interesting... Mark Andre Fleury is probably the name or the, 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 the franchise. Well... I don't know if he's the face of the franchise, Certain, but he's the most right recognizable. Right now, until player. they get a real one, yeah, yeah he's absolutely yeah. the most identifiable guy with fans. A little bit of a Michigan twist with John Merrill, who is a yep. University of Michigan graduate, yep. um, getting Jersey picked up. Double draft pick. Yep, yep, getting picked up from the Devils. He yep. had just been coming on well. Obviously, Noshek, Timu Polkinen, who the Red Wings had to wave at one point last year, picked up by Arizona. Everyone was so angry about that at the time. Well, now he's a selection for the Vegas Golden Knights. Are you really so? Are you really so worried about I'm it at not. this time? He can't create his own shot. He barely gets open. He's got a one-timer in that. That's it. Right, so this, the short memory comes into play again, and maybe a year from now I'll be biting my tongue because Thomas Noshik will have had a great year for Vegas. I wish him nothing but success. I don't. This is not bitterness from a Detroit fan who knows that you'll never see him wear the winged wheel again. It's just I'm not so I'm not so upset about the loss. And uh, yeah, do I wish they could have managed another bad contract away? Yes, but like I said, Detroit was kind of in the in between here. If they wanted to get rid of a bad deal. They would have had to do what some of these other teams did and trade an excess draft pick, knowing the situation the Red Wings in and that getting rid of one contract isn't going to change everything for them. No, but Detroit does have 11 draft picks. You could have lost a fourth-round choice or so and and parlay that with a bad contract to Vegas to give yourself a little bit of cap. Right, so it depends on how bad the contract that you're trying to get rid of it is. Yeah, and if Ny- and if you're getting rid of Nyquist and it's only two years left, it, maybe you wouldn't have need to add it a lot on to get Vegas to take that. Right. But to look at Columbus, and I know the David Clarkson contract is a, a bit of an albatross of a contract. That's not a easily navigatable deal. Right. They had to give a first-round pick for this year yeah. to get them to take I, that, I and they still that. took William Nylander from Columbus, who's a productive player. Not amazing, but a productive player. So I, I don't know what the price was. You saw Dave, David Poyle had to do this in, in Nashville, and he said yeah. the price was too high right. to convince them to take someone other than James Neal. It hurts to see him go. That's a guy coming out of the Stanley Cup final who now goes from two wins or one win away from a shot at a Game 7 for a cup to a franchise who's never played a game before. That and he's probably going to finish at the bottom of their division. I think unquestionably they'll be a bottom two team in the league. Right, right. But, I mean, everyone was talking last night as if to say that they've got some unbelievable draft picks and what a way to start. Look, oh, they're building strictly for the future. Oh, yeah. That's where that's where the unbelievable maneuvers were being made. Now, in fairness, if they wanted to take 
we got to go win a cup next year. They could have taken different guys, better guys, and built in a more immediate contender. But Absolutely. to your point, they would have walked themselves into contract issues. They would have walked themselves into developmental issues for their I'm, farm I'm system. I'm talking about better to start from, strong and young. I'm talking strictly from a Detroit standpoint. I, I really wish they had held Noshek back. It would have helped Detroit from a financial standpoint. It almost would have forced Vegas to take a bad contract off your hands. Think about it. They're not going to take Cronwall, right? They're not going to take Erickson because of the injuries and age dependent. But they could have taken Morazic. They could have taken Shane. They could have taken. They weren't going to take Luke Lindenny because he was hurt. I mean, everything else left for you to force Vegas's hand was, if you're going to take one of our guys, you're going to take that bad contract, and it's going to come off my books. The only player I think that they exposed or or was left unprotected was Nojek, who wasn't. It was exactly the opposite for that for the Red Wings, and that's my frustration with that whole I thing. I probably need to readdress the Red Wings protected list. I've kind of forgotten it since I've seen the results of that draft, but I well, would I say... Could I could tell you right now. Tatar, Nyquist... I guess right, on the defensive forward. end. It, okay, right. for defensively, so it was Mike Green, would it, it was Ouellette Danny DeKaiser, and it was Dick Jansen. Right, so I guess if you protect Noshek, you got to think about who you would have lost. I, I, I'm not that hurt by having lost Noshek, and... I think if the alternative is them taking Peter Morazic, sure. I don't know if that's what people want. And right. I, I would th I would look at who they did take in terms of goaltenders. They took uh, J.F. Barube from the New York Islanders. The right. first pick was uh, Calvin Picard from Colorado, and right. then they took Mark-Andre Mark Mark Fleury. So right. they took – people had speculation they were going to take six goalies and start wheeling and dealing guys because there's enough clubs out there. Buffalo's going to need some help. Calgary obviously just made a move to go get Mike Smith. Um, Vancouver has Ryan Miller but could need another guy. Carolina could need another. There's a lot of teams that are not going to go get a front-of-the-line top-end starter yeah. but are going to get either a solid backup or somebody to go in rotation with a guy that they already have in the, in the system. So I think that uh, there's no question that after all the speculation, Vegas, what they ended up doing was just taking three goalies that they're, they want to stay in black, gold and the little bit of red trim that's on their sweater they want those guys to be part of their organization and they see a place for them in the organization moving forward mm -hmm. whereas there's plenty of trades organized for position players and i think that's where we're going to see the bulk of them come to fruition i, I, I never thought vegas would take peter Moret. never in a, 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 a why I, I, I why does it seem so irrational irrational why, because, why not? Okay, Mark Andre Fleury. We, when's the last time Mark Andre Fleury played a full season? Well, that, no, that's a He's fair point. A but that's why they starter. got two other guys. Mark Andre Fleury. Look, Pittsburgh doesn't win the cup without Mark Andre Fleury. Peter Morazic is, is is just a guy. Okay, that's all he is. He's just a guy. He's got a terrible attitude. He's 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 not professional at all. Right, and we overvalue our players more than anybody else. Peter Morazic is just a guy. The three guys they got, I, I bet you he wasn't even on their radar. I bet you I bet you Vegas looked at him and goes, What's the point? Well, we don't know what George McPhee and, and well, the office. Well, I guarantee you, they, they know what the Red Wings they know what the Red Wings know. They know that yeah, they he was know. the guy who's who, who's the primary reason that Jim Bedard was know fired. Their, we don't know their opinion of the inside of the Red Wings locker room. Maybe yeah, they think it's a pressure packed environment that does, not a lot of players, or especially European players, will will thrive in. I, I told you last week the the problems with Peter Morazic. If anybody would listen, I told you last week, and what has come out. Look at all the reports. It's not coincidental. Craig Custance, all these other reports are talking about Peter Morazic isn't professional. Peter Morazic has a bad attitude. He left the ice in a morning skate when he found out Jared Coro was going to be the starter. People had to go and chase him down and say, hey, dude, you don't act this way. Who wants, who wants to deal with that? He's a 24-year-old baby. People don't want to deal with that. That's all well and good, but I don't think it's so irrational. What is he making? What 4.5, four, yeah, right, four through arbitration for what? Another one year or another two years? Right, another year. Okay, yeah. so it what is free, my question is what is the big risk for Vegas if if you take him as your third goalie, if you still have either Picard or Barube you want yeah. as your backup, yeah. or even as your backup goalie, knowing that Marc Andre Fleury is probably not going to play 80 games for you this right, year, right. you got him on a one year. If you know 4.5 is too rich for your taste, then he's gone after this year, or you can flip him at the deadline for somebody that else, somebody else that wants to, you know, well, get a six could, round draft pick or well, something I, like that back. But I think it's, that's it's, really easily said, easier said than done. Saying we'll just flip him at the trade deadline. Oh, you I'm not. Okay, you if he doesn't play well, then he gets cut. If he doesn't get played well, then he gets cut. traded him, but it's no loss to Vegas. It's no, there's no skin off Vegas's teeth. I think he was the most talented goalie, not named Mark Andre Fleury, that was exposed in that okay, draft. I would tell you this: it, you, here's here's what it was to Vegas. It means you miss out on another opportunity to take somebody else who can help you and so, save okay, you some so, money. Right? If they see one of those guys, if they see Picard or Barube as an investment that they're going to build up for, a la Jimmy Garoppolo uh, over in New England, a guy that they're going to develop for a couple years and then ship away when they when they 
maybe you don't need, then that's different. But I, I see it as a more fragile situation. I don't see Marc-Andre Fleury as an 80-game player. I see one of the two goal goalies that they drafted needing to be able to play for them and put them in competitive situations. Yeah. And I'm not saying that the two guys they took couldn't do that, but I think Peter Morazic was a lot more, a lot safer and more sure bet to do that. And I think he's the guy that you can hit a home run on. I, I think you're underestimating the negativity that is associated with the individual. And that is, when you go into a locker room, the last thing you want to have to deal with, especially when you're Gerard Gallant taking over a new program, is this guy being a difficult player. Then and why did they, they take James Neal? Uh, is, is James Neal have the same reputation as Peter Morazic, where he's he, actually given up on teammates and things like that? He's kind of swept out of, of a locker room or two before he got to Nashville. I know he wore a letter in Nashville, but... I don't know. I, look, I know they're not all one-for-one one situations, yeah. and I don't, I'm not trying to make excuses for Peter Mrazek's attitude because it sounds like it was a major inhibitor on him for either being a contributing member for, to the Red Wings in the latter half of the season or having a, a legit chance at a fresh start uh, during the expansion draft. Um, I just don't think it's – again, I'm not pounding the table for that, but I just don't think it's as irrational as we've made it out to be for Vegas to have taken them, whereas everyone else made it seem like an well, easy choice. All right, well, as I've made it out to be, not we. Uh, last thing be before we, we end this uh, episode of Shep Shower and Jave, uh, brought to you by Fifth Avenue and Northwestern Tech. Uh, the, the NBA draft, by the time this is thrown out there, the NBA draft will have concluded, but the NBA draft is tonight. I just want the one guy you think the Pistons will take and I'll give you three names since they're the closest associated with Detroit. Ready? The names are Donovan Mitchell, Louisville guard. I think he's in the form of a Joe Dumars type player. Luke Kennard, the shooting guard from Duke, who is a terrible perimeter defender but can shoot the blood out of it at 6'6". Or Zach Collins, who's a stretch four out of Gonzaga. Who do you think the Pistons go with tonight? I think uh, what I've seen be projected as kind of the safest pick or the most likely pick is probably Kennard, and that's, I think, by virtue of the fact that most people expect he will still be there at 12. Right. But I think the most excitement probably comes about Donovan Mitchell. What do you think? I would, If Donovan Mitchell's there, I would take him. I think he'll be gone. Thus, I think they'll take Luke Kennard because of the shooting aspect. If they take Zach Collins, and look, he's a good player. Don't get me wrong. He's 19. That's another stretch four. They already have Tobias Harris, John Luer, Henry Ellenson, and then you're going to take Zach Collins. Unless there's a trade in the making, that would gravely disappoint me if I'm a Pistons fan, which I am. Uh, a trade up or a trade down? Well, or, or maybe one that doesn't involve that draft slide. I, I suppose it depends. It's a po uh, I, I think it depends on who I'm talking about players that they may trade. Okay. There is a belief that Andre Drummond is on the block like there was last year, which would, no, nothing more would excite me than well, that opportunity. Well, interesting you say that because I was going to ask if another guy, I don't know if the perception is he would have to slip to get to 12 or that 12 might be the the right spot for him, but uh, Laurie Markkinen is also a guy whose name has been associated with Detroit a little bit. Not as strong a fit or as strong an NBA uh, yeah. projection as the first three names you mentioned, and I think Pistons fans, though they have a number of needs, would really like to see somebody uh, that can shoot the ball besides Catavius Caldwell-Pope. Well, he's also a legit seven-footer. Right, okay. but so my point is if Drummond's on the block and part of that percept, you know, part of that move, the construct of that move is replacing him in the middle, is Laurie Markkinen a guy the Pistons will look at? I don't know. Another again, another stretch four. I think somehow they have to do a better job of being getting guys on the perimeter who can create shots and make shots. I don't think they have nearly enough of those. Chef Shower and Shave brought to you by Northwestern Tech and by Fifth Avenue in Royal Oak.